Wow. The energy that begins worship together with all the conversations that are happening. Truly, we are enjoying gathering together once again to worship our Lord. What a great day it is, a day in which we get a sense that there'll be just a few more days of kind of that summer fall before things really start to get cold. So it's a good time. We want to welcome those of you who might be visiting with us this morning, whether you're here in person and have a chance to join with us afterwards. We meet downstairs in the fellowship hall and lots of good goodies are found there. Plus the conversations are good. As well as those of you who are with us online, we're pleased to have you here with us today. Whether it's now in the present or at some later point, we pray that this would be a time of worship for you as well. As we gather, we gather from many different circumstances. Much has happened in the last week. For some of us, it's been a week like it's always been. It just seems the same manner of doing things. Nothing really has happened. For others of us, we have shoved three to four weeks of activities into one week. And we're feeling that sense of exhaustion. We've come here out of a pattern and a, a need to be with God, but we're wondering if we'll be able to stay awake. No matter whether we are coming here refreshed or whether we're coming here stressed, we have come to worship the Lord, to remember the one who cares for us, watches over us, and truly sustains us. Indeed, we share with the psalmist who says in Psalm 89, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Let us indeed sing to the steadfast love of the Lord and let us make known his love to everyone who will hear. Let us praise God. There's 
Please. 
wonderful reminder that Christ is in us, that it is no longer us, so that we can now greet one another with the peace of Christ as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's greet one another. Before we head into prayer, a few items just to bring to your attention as we have gathered in worship today. A reminder that our Sunday school programs began last week and new opportunities even emerged today. So I uh, hope that you have time in your day to make some investment in your learning. Last week we talked about faith development, for example. So uh, this morning, obviously, the after worship and after some cookies and juice, the children will have time to go have time for Sunday school. There's a women's Bible study also that takes place in the conference room. And then this Sunday, kicking off for about four, possibly five weeks, but more likely four weeks, we're going to have a study on kings that will be right there in the fellowship hall at one end where that uh, larger TV is. So uh, it's called King Me. So I encourage you to make time for that if you have time, or even this week, uh, starting Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., will be a Bible study on Romans that will begin. So I encourage you to look at that as well. And finally, uh, this Wednesday kicks off our Wednesday night programs. And our kickoff takes place actually outside, kind of a picnic of sorts and, and fun and games. And that will take place uh, right down the road here uh, near, near the community center, the ball fields, uh, the firehouse. I have all different ways in which I 
uh, find landmarks. So forgive me if I'm not using a landmark you're familiar with, but this is where we met last year, and there'll be food and plenty of activities, so I encourage you to make time for that as well. Let's take time now for prayer. Almighty God, may our hearts be stilled in your presence. May all the noise of life, all the clutter of our days, be still before you. For in this moment as we come and gather and worship you, we realize how great and wonderful you are. As we sing songs, our hearts are awakened to the truths we hold dear within, that you indeed are God, that you have sent your Son in a demonstration of your incredible love for us, that he gave his life for us, the forgiveness of our sins, the cleansing that we are given, the righteousness now we live in that is not ours but is ours through Jesus Christ. We praise you, almighty God. In this moment, all things fall away as we recognize how great and wonderful you are and how dear and deep is your love for each one of us. Such love is hard to comprehend when we consider who we really are, when we plumb the depths of our each individual mistakes, our drifting away or even running away from you. Those parts of our lives that we still preserve to ourselves that you call us to clean out. Almighty God, we are amazed that you forgive ones such as us. Help us to embrace the forgiveness you've now given us, the grace that we now live in, and help us to extend that grace and forgiveness to others. For it is easy for us to go into the world and find others who are struggling and suffering as we do. It is easy to console ourselves that somehow we're better on the measure of life because we find people with worse problems and struggles than our own. But Almighty God, the good news is that you do not distinguish between the level of right and wrong within each of us, but rather, in fact, see us for who we are, broken and sinful, running from you. And yet you have chosen to love us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Praise be to God, you who rescue us from this body of death. It is in this joy that we come before you this morning, confessing that which we still need to confess, recognizing that which still needs to change within each of us, and yet rejoicing that you call us to live forward in grace your grace. Help us as we go forward this day. Help us to go forward as lights reflecting your light. Help us to share your love and strength with others. Guide us, O oh Lord, and care for those who are precious to us, those who are on our hearts and our minds, whether battling continual illness recurrent health problems, or recovering from recent surgeries or procedures. You know what each of us needs, O oh Lord. We pray for your healing touch, for your presence amidst us while we're hurting and distracted. Help us that our hearts may always turn to you, that we who are well may be your hands and feet to those who are not. Guide us, O oh Lord, that we might live for you. Help us also, Lord, to look out to this world, to the many who are around us, not only in our community, but beyond. Help us as we let us stay on World Communion Sunday, look out to the many believers across this globe, many who have it far worse than us, who even now meet in secret 
to proclaim and glorify your name. Help us, O Lord. Help us to be a strength and a relief and an encouragement to those churches that are struggling. Be with believers around this globe that we might all praise your name. All this we lift before you as your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The children may be excused at this time to go to children's worship if they haven't already made their way. Last week, I shared with you that we've begun a four-week series on our church's core values. You may remember last fall, we took a few-week journey looking at our mission statement that we are um, uh, connecting people to God's family, word, and way of life. And we broke down each one of those sections each week. And this, this year, we're taking this early fall time to look at our core values. Now, the mission statement was something that we repeated quite often, and, and it's almost embedded in us. We, we said it so many times. But our core values, well, they were developed and put forward right around the time that COVID squashed so many things. So it's likely highly likely that even though we mentioned them last week, that if put on the spot, we would struggle to name all four of them. We might even struggle to name one of them. So just to remind you, our core values for this church, for Hamilton Reform, values that reflect who we are have to do with faith, generosity, compassion, and hospitality. Faith, generosity, compassion, and hospitality. You know, when others describe our church other than the big church, you know, the one that the big church on M40, my prayer for us is that they would describe us as faithful, generous, compassionate, and full of hospitality. Because it's something we've seen within ourselves already, these four traits, these four values. And when you have a value that is good, you just want to accentuate and further develop. And so last week, we talked about faith. Really what we've said is it's intentional faith. Intentional faith development. And we got to pay important attention to those words that come before each of our things. So, for example, today is selfless generosity. That intentional faith was, we talked about last week, was a recognition that we can have faith, but we are to purposefully work on our faith. We are to grow in our faith. That is the calling of every Christian, but it's truly a belief of what's happening here in our church that in large part we are intentional about our faith intentional about growing it, which once again reminds me to almost a commercial, if you will, a reminder that, again, you have opportunities, even beginning today, with taking time following worship, the, the King Me idea, or going to the women's Bible study, or even going to the men's Bible study that takes place every other Saturday morning there in the book of Acts, or even starting Tuesday morning if you have time at 10 a.m. to look over the book of Romans but also what you can do in your own home life, in your own time, your, your own Bible time or devotions or whether it is reading Scripture around the meals, a time to intentionally grow in our faith. Today, 
is about generosity, particularly about selfless generosity, a character value of us, that we are generous. I've seen that from the very start, but also that we are selfless in our generosity, which means we take an additional step in our being generous. We don't just give people what's ever left over that we're not using. We actually sacrifice from ourselves, and that is a core value of who we are, and we want to further grow in that core value. We're going to allow Scripture to speak to us today about that core value of selfless generosity. Now, you may remember that last week, if you were here, when we talked about intentional faith development, that we looked back into the book of Acts, and we dealt with that early church that was taking place and growing in Antioch. That early church that needed to grow in its understanding that there were Christians there, Jews who believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, They had fled because of persecution, and some of them had actually told other non-Jews, that is what's often referred to as Gentiles or what the book of Acts calls, um, oh goodness, Hellenists, that Jesus Christ was Lord. And surprise, surprise, they came to believe that. Uh, history and uh, uh, the forebearers of us, many of us who've come to believe, who've never had any part of being Jewish. But they need to grow quickly, and what is this newfound faith in Christ? And so Barnabas went and called Paul back, and they started to grow and and teach for a whole year. Well, we're going to pick up with that same young church in Antioch. And we're going to fast forward just a little bit in their history. It's what comes right after the time of Barnabas going and recruiting Paul. But imagine this coming maybe a year into their teaching. And we're going to read from Acts chapter 11, verse 27. Let's pray that God opens his word to us. Oh, Lord, you know, you know fully what we need to hear. You know how each one of us is different from one another, and yet somehow through your word, your spirit knows exactly what each of our hearts needs. We pray that you would remove any distractions, anything that is a barrier that keeps us from hearing and taking in your word this morning. May you guide us, O Lord. May we feel as if we've taken hold of your hand and have been walked to exactly what you want us to see. We pray this, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Beginning at the 27th verse. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Claudius was one of the emperors of Rome. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, on simple looking at it, it's just four quick verses. And in many ways, they seem rather simple. They give some kind of historical background, it seems. And 
one might easily just read over and read past it, except for when we start to peel the layers back of what is being said, when we stop and consider that of all the things that Luke had to write in the book of Acts, for some reason he felt compelled to share this experience that he'd gleaned from taking all the information that he'd been given, he felt in his writing, led by the Spirit, that we still need to hear this, what we might qualify as a historical anecdote. But yet it's so much more. There's so much more here in these four verses. And let me see if you'll agree with me. I'll remind you that this church in Antioch is young. It's new. Not only is it young and new, but it is full of not only Jews who've come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, thereby believing in Christ, but it's full, as I said just a few moments ago, of people who before this knew nothing about any of this. Oh, they may have encountered Jews. They may have found them to be odd at times or to keep different circumstances that were tolerated by Rome that ruled this whole area. They may not have participated in all the cultural realities of worshiping the many gods and all that goes with that. But in large part, the people that came to believe that Jesus was the Christ who did not have a Jewish background were new to all this. It is a young church in many ways, and Paul and Barnabas and others are working diligently in training up and teaching them what it means to now follow Jesus. That God has actually given a gift to all of us in sending his son into the world. That God has chosen through his son Jesus to forgive us all our sins. He's chosen to do so out of his tremendous love for us. Such love that is demonstrated that his son goes to the cross and dies in our place. This is good news, and it's good news for all people. As the angels once said to the shepherds long before, today we give you good news of great tidings. Right? It's for all people. And in this new early church, a church mixed with Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah and people who knew nothing of this before, this church that's growing up in its understanding, people who are having to rethink what they always knew and others who are having to grasp on to stuff that's entirely new as they're being formed and developing all by the help of the church in Jerusalem that first sent them Barnabas to inquire and see what's going on. Barnabas, who went and recruited Saul to come back and help teach. As all of this is going on, suddenly other visitors come from Jerusalem. It's kind of interesting the way it puts it. It says that they came down. Well, actually, if we look on a map, it's north. It's not the way we would describe it. But coming down references that coming down out of the hills of Judea, that coming down, but it also has a theological reference of sort. They're coming down to those who may not be as close to the temple and all that goes on there. And yet, what the people that come down to them are prophets. Prophets are ones who speak on behalf of God. And one of them, Agabus, who's named for us, Agabus, who will show up much later in the book of Acts, towards the very end, one who will come and prophesy to Paul and bind up himself to show that Paul, at some future point, is going to be arrested. This same Agabus, who plays later, many acts later, comes now and says, that the word of the Lord is there's going to be a famine throughout the land, a severe famine. We can look back in the history and the accounts and the Roman accounts and so forth and see that indeed there was a famine. It may have not been over the entire world, but it certainly was over that whole region. 
And so the early church in Antioch had a few things to do. First, it had to decide whether or not to believe, that is to have faith in the word that has just been given them. They had to decide first and foremost whether this truly was God's word, whether this truly was a true prophet and they were hearing God's word. We do this all the time when we are given some kind of information that is appalling or worrisome or sense, gives us a sense that life's going to change dramatically. We question that word. We question whether that's true. There's a whole world of people telling us that our financial markets are all going to fall apart and it's going to be doom and gloom. The, the people like this exist all the while and there's a part in which it preys on us because there, there's a part in which we know it's possible, but there's another part of us that believes that it won't happen. And so where the, this land had lived through other famines in other generations, it's possible, but is it really going to happen? And this is true for us as Christians all the while, that we will hear of possibilities and we have to discern whether God is really in it. So the first step was they had to come to believe that this was true. And the second step was perhaps even more challenging. What to do about it? How to respond or to respond at all? Remember, this is a church that has a mixed representation, a representation of Jews that have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they are there in Antioch because they've fled the hundreds of miles because of great persecution that grow broke out all around Jerusalem and Judea, a persecution that chased them out for fear of their lives. They left behind their homes. They left behind relationships. They left behind so much. There must have been some level of concern in their hearts, maybe even a little bitterness. And on the other hand, you have new found Christians, new, new believers in Jesus Christ that have had nothing to do with any of this. And the question comes, what is all this teaching, what is all this faith development done for them over the last year? What's happened? Have they just learned and become more educated? What's taken place in them? Our answer is in what they choose to do. Our answer is in the fact that this church that is growing and blossoming didn't just circle the wagons, but rather were willing to look out to the larger world around them. On this worldwide Communion Sunday, when we are reminded or called to re be reminded that we are not the only church, that there are other churches in our community, that there are other churches in the greater Holland and Allegan area, that there are so many churches here in Michigan and in Iowa and Illinois and California, that there, there are churches throughout the globe, in Africa, South America, in China, in places even now in Armenia where, where people are feeling oppressed, that we are part of a worldwide church, brothers and sisters in Christ. This church in Antioch was able to look beyond themselves and look back to Judea and Jerusalem and realized how great the need was going to be if, in fact, there was going to be a famine. And so what to do? How to respond? The disciples, that is, not the disciples as we typically think as far as the 12 who followed Jesus, but rather now is another reference of those who were followers of the way, those who were first called Christians in this young church of Antioch, now is another, another reference to all of them, the disciples, that is, the ones who followed Jesus. To disciple is to walk in the way. These disciples determined together 
that everyone among them should give according to his or her ability. Notice what it says. It says everyone. It, it's not just um, that, hey, you know, as a church, we'll, we'll give something, but it's that everyone is included in this project. And there's a recognition that the abilities among them are vary. I mean, we know later from some of the reading of this church in Antioch that there are those who had nothing, but there are also those who probably had a fair amount of resources. Antioch was kind of a wealthy city, a high trading place, and we know through the listing of some of the names that there were some who had significant resources. But all of them were encouraged to send relief in accord with their abilities. That send relief is a, a great way in which translators try to make sense or translate a word for us that we might otherwise stumble over because it wouldn't be the way we'd say it. The word that, for relief that they translate there is diakonia, which might sound somewhat familiar to you. It's the word from which we say deacons. That they would send deacons? No, diaconia. That they would send ministry. Each according to their ability. And of course, the ministry that they would send in large part would be relief, that they would send financial resources and so forth. It's hard to make food travel that distance, but they would do whatever they could to send relief for the famine that was to come, that they would send ministry. Anytime we write out a few dollars or hand over a few resources, we're giving ministry. Here's an example of incredible selfless generosity because they too would have faced the famine. They too would have struggled, and yet they gave of themselves to support a region from which many had come and had been had terrible last day's experience, and yet now they're sending back and sacrificing for their relief. We'll see this later in the church of Philippi, the very church that before it became a church, the people who persecuted and beat Paul almost to death and threw him in jail. And yet later we find that that same church that grows out of there becomes a church that amidst their incredible sufferings and struggle and persecution are still giving of themselves to other churches, not because they have a lot of resources, but because they've identified that that is what it is to follow Jesus Christ, to walk in the footsteps of the one who gave his all for us that we are called to give of ourselves, not just to give what's left over that we're not using, but to give of ourselves. Selfless generosity. I've seen it already in my limited time here again and again. Just a few weeks ago, we had a, a speaker up here telling us about um, Grant Me Hope, a ministry for orphans who age out of the foster system, or excuse me, foster children who age out of the foster system, and where do they live, and how, does, how do they still get the help and the resources? So many of us rely on our family systems as we are in those early years of development into the world, the adult world. And that grant me hope, we, we sat here and we listened to how they're working on a new facility and trying to get that up and going and for more people. And, you know, we appreciated hearing about that ministry. But there were members here who quietly on their own went and gave time and resources to that ministry put hours of work in, helping to work on the facilities, given their different abilities. What they were able to do, they gave because it's a core value of who we are here at Hamilton Reformed. 
Which reminds me of another component that you've seen advertised or will see advertised in the newsletter. Just this last week, the consistory was given a notice of information from our brothers and sisters at Calvary Reformed in Cleveland, a church that we have been invested in through the years where we've gone and helped them and even laid bricks and helped restore and build buildings. A church in which one of the, the uh, sons of one of our members is a pastor there. We've invested in them. And the consistory received word that that church is struggling financially. The economy has been rough on all of us, but for them who are living on a shoestring, the utility is going up, and the same people they're giving because of their resources has had to go down because the dollar doesn't stretch like it will, and they're seeing a shortfall coming up. They can see the end of the year, and they can see the shortfall that will be. And so they're reaching out to their partner churches saying, is there anything you can do? We already know you're supporting us, but is there anything else? Already this church at Calvary is thinking about next year and reducing their ministry level. And they've reached out. And the consistory looked at this reach out and they said, you know what? Too many in this congregation are invested in Calvary Reformed. We can't simply make a decision. We need to throw it out to the whole congregation that you all would feel cheated if we didn't share the reality with you. And so on October 22nd, the consistory has determined that in worship we will take a special offering for Calvary Reformed. Because we're part of a larger church. As we take communion today, we will be taking communion and that we will be one with Christ and we'll be one with our brothers and sisters around the globe that hour by hour, minute by minute, churches around this globe have set to take communion together on this day. Oh, our schedules vary from church to church around the globe. But today, we are all taking communion together because we are one in Christ. The core value of selfless generosity is a defining piece of who we are. It's in our DNA. We've inherited it from the church of old. But it is a component that we have chosen to accentuate and use as a defining piece of who we are. And so as we work on our faith development, may we also work on our selfless generosity, realizing those tugs and pulls that the Spirit is placing on us, many of us in all different quadrants, the call to sacrifice and give of ourselves in the name of Jesus Christ so that others may experience the grace of God. In the very beginning, when God calls out Abram and calls him to go from a land that he knew to a land that he does not yet know, that calling was so that he could be blessed, so that he in turn and the people that come from him could be a blessing to others. We stand in that tradition, in that calling, that we be a blessing to others through our selfless generosity. May God be praised. Let's pray. Almighty God, may you bless us in this time. May your words sit upon us and challenge us. May we consider again how we might follow you and sacrifice in your name. Help us, O Lord, to hear the needs that are out there and help us in responding. And may your name be glorified in each and every action we take. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.
Won't you be seated? Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper which we are about to take part in is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. Remembrance is that component in which we often call this the Lord's Supper, and we remember the Last Supper, and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. We remember how he came into this world and how he redefined the Passover and how he gave of himself. And there's a part in which we remember that Last Supper, and we have a certain so sense of somberness, a heaviness, as we knew he was going to the cross. We remember what he did here. Communion is another name we have for this meal and another part of why we gather around this feast. And all the more important on this day, this worldwide communion day, because we recognize that we are in communion with the saints who've gone before, with one another, with the greater global church and that we're in communion with our Lord Jesus Christ as well. That is, he calls for us to partake in his body and blood through the bread and the grape juice. That he's calling us to be one, to be one body. That though we can often talk of our differences and distinguish how we're different from one another and even have issues with one another, this is a meal that reminds us to come back together to truly forgive one another as we've been forgiven and to live now instead in the grace of Jesus Christ with one Lord. Remembrance the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, communion. The third word we often use around this that we think of in higher church assemblies, uh, uh, the Episcopalians or the Roman Catholics or, or the Methodists, we hear it called the Eucharist. In truth, the third reason we come and celebrate is this is a feast of hope that we partake not just in this moment, but we partake knowing that there is a future moment that is certain and absolute. That there is a day when Jesus will come again and will take us to be with him. And that we will in celebration partake with him, that we will fully be with him. There is an expectation that is in this meal of what is to come, that we are, in fact, a people of hope, not a people who just live in the moment, who live the way life is, but we live in expectation of the life that is to come, that is certain, that is absolute, that cannot be taken from us. It's not a maybe, it's not a possibly, it is absolute. And so we partake in that spirit as well, in remembrance and in hope, and today very much in communion with our brothers and sisters around the globe. Will you pray with me? Almighty God is our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. You have created the heavens with all of its hosts and the earth with all of its plenty. 
You've given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you've shown us the fullness of your love in sending your son, Jesus Christ, into the world. The eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior, O oh God, we praise and thank you. We honor your glorious name. We together join with the angels saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Most precious God. We remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered up on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. We proclaim the mystery of the faith that Christ has died, that Christ is risen, and that Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that this bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us and all brothers and sisters gathered around this globe the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being gathered together with him, we may attain to the unity of the faith, and as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O oh Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. May the elders come forward, please. same night that Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and he broke it for them, saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. All those who have confessed their faith in Christ Jesus and are members of a Christian church are welcome at the Lord's table, please.
The bread which we break is the communion to us of the body of Christ.
The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion to us of the blood of Christ. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for feeding us at your table, for guiding, watching over us, but also watching over your whole church throughout this globe. We pray that you be with our brothers and sisters, whether they be next door or around the globe, that together we might praise and glorify your name and be reminded of who we are because of whose we are. May all this give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forevermore. Amen.